This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Our text for today, our Old Testament lesson, starts out in a very familiar way when talking about the Israelites. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. The Lord had made a covenant with these people, right? Going all the way back to Abraham. He graciously freed them from the hands of Egypt. He gave them victory over all his enemies, all the way to the promised land. How did they respond? They worshipped the golden calf. First chance they could. They ran into the deceitful arms of worthless idols made by human hands. Every single enemy they defeated, they picked up some kind of household god. And they started to follow those gods, those ba bales, those asherah poles. The people of Israel had a severe trust problem. When they couldn't see it, and they couldn't believe it, they couldn't touch it, they couldn't measure it, they thought, well, I don't know if this God is real or not, so guess what? I'm going to grab up everything I can, I'm going to cover up all my bases, in case there's something I'm missing to get into heaven. And in the process, they angered the one God who could save them. And the issue was, they were in this terrible cycle. A cycle of sin that came back to bite them time and time again. The question I want to ask today is, when will the cycle end? The book of Judges can be summed up this way. If you ever read through it, I encourage you to read through the book of Judges sometime in your private devotions. The Lord blessed the Israelites beyond compare. He blessed them with peace. They get too comfortable. They begin to follow these other gods. They go back to their old ways. God allows a nation to come in and lay siege of the city. They cry out to the Lord for mercy. They repent of their sins. The Lord sends a judge to save them. They rejoice and they experience 30 to 40 years of peace. They get too comfortable. They follow other gods. And guess what happened next? God allows the nation to come in, to overtake them. They cry out to the Lord for mercy, and the cycle continues. That's the whole book of Judges. And it seems to people like them. Or did they? At the end of our text, they were genuinely sorry. They repented. They said, we're going to get rid of these things. We're going to get rid of these idols. And 30, 40 years go by, and they're right back to where it all began. Why? There was a breakdown in communication. One generation didn't share with the next. They forgot God's mercy. They forgot the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord. You and I are no strangers to this cycle of sin. As it drags us all down, and sometimes we can't seem to get out of that temptation that trips us up every single time. The cycle of sin is sort of like addiction. Young man in his 30s starts out getting addicted to alcohol. He drinks so much that he can't feel the effects anymore. And he desires a greater high. So he turned to heroin. And after years of abuse, his body gets used to it, so his highs get less and less. He needs and he wants something more. And he gets so wrapped up in his drug addiction that he begins to neglect his family. He wastes his family's savings. And in his addiction, his unfaithfulness, he loses his family. His wife leaves him for her own protection. This sends him into a downward spiral. Because this young man already has an issue with, with depression. And that's why he's turned to alcohol and drugs. And so he turns to meth to get his fix. Now his own family, his mother, his, his relatives don't even recognize him. Meth really messes with your brain. It makes you paranoid. It makes you scared. It makes you have conspiracy theories, hallucinations, Superman tendencies. Just to name a few side effects. Not to mention what it does to your appearance. This man I'm describing was a baptized, confirmed, and married man in the church. This is a man like you and me. He's a Lutheran. 
And when he was sober-minded and the guilt weighed down on him again, he met with his pastor, one he felt comfortable with talking to. The visits were sometimes weeks apart, months apart, even years apart. And every time he came back to the pastor, he confessed his sins, he repented and wanted to make things right. And every single time the pastor offered that forgiveness in Jesus' name, he started off good, he sobered up, he began to see the blessings in his life, but then the stress of trying to find a job, guilt over losing his family, and other pressures begin to bring him down. And then those old friends start coming around again. And they're not really friends, they're more like enablers. Those in the drug community, those who know him all too well. And the pastor goes the extra mile to get him help. He even went to the drug house to, to offer him help and support in his moment of lowness and, in, and his sadness. And he wept before the pastor. And then one day the pastor was overjoyed when he heard this member had finally checked into rehab in a different state, away from all the influences. Three months go by, sounds like he's finally getting on the right track, he's finally turned his life around. But then an arrest warrant comes from a previous arrest, and it brings him back to his hometown. He spends time in jail, after getting out he hopes to make amends, but then those friends start coming around again back into his old way of life, and back to jail he goes. The pastor feels depleted. He hoped that this treatment would finally be the thing that would get him through. This was the ticket, but then he finds out from other professionals in the field that deal with this sort of thing, that it takes seven or eight years, times, I should say times, of going to rehab to finally stick. So the question I'm asking, and I'm sure you're asking in your mind, is when will the cycle end? Right? When do they get through it? What, what's the problem? We have a growing problem in our country. And it's, it's drugs, it's alcohol, it's addiction. Here's a quote from four years ago. Drug overdose is the leading cause of accidental death in the US. 52,404 lethal drug overdoses in 2015. Opioid addiction is driving this epidemic with 20,101 over death, dose deaths related to prescription pain relievers and 12,990 overdose deaths related to heroin in 2015. <coughs> that was four years ago. I'd hate to look at the numbers now. Why do people go this way? Why do people get themselves into that cycle? Because people want to escape the realities of life. Maybe someone has psychological issues, intense stress, or simply depression. Some begin, begin, begin taking drugs for simpler things, for experimentation, or even recreation. Addiction to certain substances is just one example of the terrible cycle people find themselves in. What is the root problem? The root problem is that there is sin, and they can't deal with it, and so they try to cover it up. And that sin affects all of us. There are particular sins that you and I are prone to. It may not be alcohol, it may not be drugs, it may not be opioids, whatever you're driven to. You have a problem like I have a problem falling back into that sin again and again. When, when all the weaknesses, they tend to drag us down. You run to those sins when life gets difficult, relationships are strained, and the temptation is just too much to bear. And you fall back into that pattern of sin. And once the dust settles, how do you feel? You're left with guilt, shame, and despair. Not unlike that young man that took his father's inheritance and ran. And in desperation, you cry out to the Lord for mercy. God the Father looks down to you, his beloved child. He has compassion, and he forgives you because of the sacrifice of his son. You're forgiven. Life gets better. Everything is sailing right along. But then the stresses begin to mount. The temptation to fall back into that certain sin becomes great again. 
pride gets the better of you. You're thinking you're strong enough to handle this all on your own, and it starts all over again. When will the cycle end? The cycle ends when we run to the Father like the prodigal son. The son realized how lost and destitute he was. And when he came to his senses, right, he ran back to the Father, knowing that he would hopefully bring him back and welcome him back. How did the Father respond? He didn't hold back his forgiveness. As soon as he saw the Son, he was moved with compassion, he ran to him, welcomed him with open arms. That's the relationship you and I have with the Father, the one who loves us unconditionally. He welcomes you back every time. He will never turn you away. That middle section between verses 3 to, to the, the, end, the, the story of the, the father and the sons, there's a talk of, of a shepherd who leaves the 99 to go after the one lost sheep. Why? Because he loves you that way. He loves you so much that he was willing to sacrifice his only son for you. His love is so great that he kept that covenant, right? All the way from Genesis through the entire scriptures. He kept his covenant all the way to the cross, to the dark, gloomy grave, to the empty tomb, to the ascension, back to glory, and for all eternity. God the Father has an unending mercy, an unending love reserved just for you. Now, did you notice the mercy section in the Old Testament? It, it's hard to find because you're, you're hearing about God's wrath, you're hearing about the punishment, you're hearing about all these things. But yet, at the very end of the text, it said, and he, that is God, could bear Israel's misery no longer. What does that tell you about the heart of God? So he doesn't want his children to suffer. He doesn't want you to suffer. He has nothing but compassion for you. He forgives, he guides, he strengthens you with no conditions. There's nothing attached to it. He doesn't say, if you, he says, I'm going to give you this as a free gift from his son. The Father will never turn you away. God is greater than any sin that you might be wrestling with. God the Father can help you overcome your temptations through faith in His Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. In fact, when your heart is leading you astray, and it continues to lead you down the path of temptation, guilt, and shame, remember, God is even greater than your own heart. Stop and think about that. God is greater than your heart. But pastor, what I feel is so intense. What I feel is so real, and I'm not negating that. But God is greater than your heart. See where your heart is leading. Is your light lead, heart leading you down a path of sin or a path to the Savior? God is greater even than your heart. And he offers you that forgiveness in his son. He points you to his son for relief. Many of us have family members and friends who, who have addictions. And I'd like to point you to our church library. We have about 50 of these pamphlets. Jesus is Lord, addiction is not. And I encourage you to take them, hand them to those family members. It's a self-study guide meant for prison ministry, but you can take it to anybody you know, anybody you want. They're free. Take them. And there's other pamphlets there too. Take them. Share them. Share the love of Christ. Be reminded that Jesus can overcome. Jesus alone can help you find true peace. His love helps us all fight temptation. It helps us get out of the cycle. His love, His grace, His forgiveness help us overcome any temptation that we're wrestling with. And He alone can give us the peace that we need to end that cycle of sin. Focus on your Savior. Focus on Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Please stand.
May that wonderful peace of God, which goes beyond all human understanding, so guard and keep your minds, your faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.